On the right-hand side, on page 117, you have an anglerfish. It's a humpback anglerfish. And so that's a very deep sea fish. That would be found in the Gulf of Mexico. Remember, they're the one with the little light on their head to uh, a lure on their head. Oh, you mean to make it light up? Bioluminescence can be caused by different other living organisms, yes. And there are also some chemicals that can be used for that. I had a student ask me how big jellyfish got. This is not near Florida, so I don't want you to panic. But I had one student actually ask me how big jellyfish can get, so I wanted to show you. Jellyfish can get very large. They got as big as, like, I was looking at pictures. They're like the size of washing machines, yeah. And yeah, I think that's almost a, a washing machine type size. And they can kill you. There are Japanese fishermen that if they get caught in their nets and if they get stung in their torso area, it can kill them. So they can be very dangerous. And I think I told you that the jellyfish are at an imbalance globally. It may have been the other class that I told this. And, and literally, there are uh, nuclear power plants that are being stopped up. The uh, flow of water is being stopped up to certain nuclear power plants because of the jellyfish that are getting caught in them. And jellyfish are on the rise, and nobody seems to know why. And that's happening right here in Florida. The moon jellies used to come in in October, and now they're coming in in August. And they're coming in in droves. And then. The upside down jellies used to be in certain places. Now they're everywhere. Okay, um, <clears throat> so nobody seems to quite know what happened, but there's an imbalance, and um, that's going on. Uh, the book mentioned that at the bottom there are seeps, and I mentioned that cold seeps, and I just wanted to show you that's an actual cold seep in the uh, Gulf of Mexico at a very great depth. But there are things that actually live there. Um, some of them are some weird giant worms that live tube down worms. there. Yep, tube worms, exactly right. Um, and that's a white smoker, which is a type of cold seep as the stuff comes out. Also, when a whale dies, then a whole community will be established where that dead whale is until they eat the dead whale. And that's called a whale fall community. And that's actual pictures of a real whale fall community and some of the critters that will move in to eat that food because on the deep ocean floor, like in the Gulf or over here in the deep ocean floor, there's not a lot of food possibilities. And so they take advantage of it. On the bottom, I'm going fast because we're running out of time. On the bottom, of the Gulf of Mexico, they find briny pools. That is, you're already at a 10,000 foot depth, and then look, there's a lake of salt water at a 10,000 foot depth. And around the lake that's in the bottom of the ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, there's actually mollusks and different things that live along the edge of these briny pools, which is weird, in my opinion. So, um, and Possibly, they have, it mentioned that there are salt domes in the Gulf of Mexico, and so we have the salty areas that come up, and they're thinking that maybe like where that comes up, that that's what causes the briny pool and, and this salt that has been stuck underneath there. So anyway, and then it uh, dissolved, and that's just a picture of some of the salt domes in the Gulf of Mexico. Let's go ahead and we'll do a quick review. This is just the stuff we did last time. We won't stay here long. So we talked about how people wanted to discover things in the ocean. Does anybody remember what was the name of the um, scientific study that came out of the, the ship, the Challenger, that went around the world on the oceans, and, and their voyage around the world actually started a new science? Um, for the first time, we named that science. You guys know the ship I'm talking about, the Challenger? Yeah. Remember? Very good. That was the beginning of the study of oceanography. And remember, they went around, and I can't even imagine how hard a work it was, that they went around putting the lines down and trying to figure out the depths of the ocean, etc. cetera. And, and then that was in the late 17, uh, 1800s, I'm sorry, like 1872, in the 1870s. And then they also, they, not the same people, but people that were interested in oceanography developed a suit where they could go down at the bottom of the ocean and pump the air down to them from pumps up above. This is the 1890s. And so as we continue in time, they eventually got to where they didn't have to be attached to the ship above with a hose. They could just carry their air with them. And then it got to where you could do it not having to put on the whole suit. And what do we call this today? Scuba. Very good. And does anybody remember what scuba stands for? It's like self-contained. There you go, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. And Jane knew it too. That was good. Thank you. 
Actually, her hand went right up. That was why I said that. Good job. And so people still do use the hose ones when they're doing uh, certain types of diving. Um, from what I understand, this kind of diving can be rather dangerous. So you usually only see people that are in the Navy or that are in underwater construction or underwater demolition, stuff like that, that use these kind of things. If you're wondering what would people do underwater construction for, mostly I would say bridges. Okay, because when you're dealing with bridges, there has to be some work done underwater. So there's probably other things too, but that's the one that comes to my mind right away. And then there's these submersibles, uh, which normal people from my generation just called submarines, right? And, um, and if they go down as far as a certain point, and then if they need to send something out even further where the pressure is even worse, then they'll send out an unmanned submersible that's got little hands and um, you know cameras and stuff and lights so that they can gather data from the bottom. And then remember, this is the Aquarius, which is kind of like um, Skylab, only this one is an Aqualab, and they're called Aquanauts, the guys that actually go down and stay in it. And I'm sure there's ladies too, but probably not all at the same time. I don't know how that works. Anyway, there's all guys in this picture, so I'm just going to go with this, okay? And so um, does anybody remember where this thing is? Where in the oceans is Aquarius? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. It is in the Florida Keys, <laughs> right here at home. And so people can actually go down and, and see it, not that I would want to, and look at all the life that's decided to grow on it. That's a picture, an actual photograph of the HMS Challenger that I just, we just talked about with oceanography starting from it. That's a picture of it in 1865. Does anybody remember what happened in the United States in 1865? I just want to give us... Civil War ended. Thank you. That, that's a point of reference. So this was a picture of that ship the year the Civil War ended, to give you a little scale as far as relationally. Thank you. That was good. Um, did the rest of you know that? 1865, the year the Civil War ended? Okay. You're so good. I just, I know you guys are so good. All right. And so then the next chapter that we looked at was looking at the ocean floor and how they determined that was by using sonar, which echoes the sound off the bottom and it comes back so much easier than putting a line down and pulling the line back up, I can't even tell you. So at this point, they started to map the bottom of the whole ocean. We talked about Mary Tharp and how she wasn't allowed to go on the ships, but God still used her in a very mighty way because she was able to take all that data and put it into the form of a map of the ocean's geography, literally. She did the map of the topography, topography being the lay of the land, of the bottoms of the oceans. And in the process, remember, it gave them some backup information that the continental plates actually may exist because what they saw was, um, or I'll come back to that, what they saw was where these plates seem to come together and have these subduction zones, there would be more volcanic activity, and that's exactly what we see is where the edge of the plate is, that's the ring of fire, and that's got so many volcanoes both above ground, excuse me, above water, and below water level, there's a lot of volcanoes. And they think it's because it's where the plates are coming together, and they've subducted in these areas, so the magma is able to come up more easily, and that's also why we think we see mountain ranges there. God bless you. Now, this is pertinent information, so you need it for at least for the game next week, I know you need it. I, and you may need it for this week, I don't know. Um, but remember that how we distinguish different places in the ocean floor is right here, and we're going to look at this today, that would really be the intertidal zone. And, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. Then we go down the continental slope, which is, excuse me, the continental shelf, which is the shallow part, which here in Palm Beach is very short. It's just a very short distance before you drop off over the continental slope. And like I said, that's why so many people come here from all over the world to fish, because you can come here, get in a boat, and within a half hour, you can be deep sea fishing. I told you on my coast, you have to go for hours before you go off of the continental shelf. It's just a much broader continental shelf on the west coast of Florida. So this is cool. You can get to deep sea fishing just really easily here. And so the continental slope is where it drops off. And a plain is a flat area. Even if you went out west and you saw a really flat area, it would be called a plain. The word abyss actually, in my mind, means something very deep and very dark. Okay? So I always think of a deep, dark crack as being an abyss. Now, I had a student um, in your class on the other coast yesterday go, well, wait a minute. I've heard them 
refer to outer space as an abyss. And I'm like, yeah, very deep, very dark. That works. <laughs> you know. So if you put abyssal, meaning very deep, very dark, plain, wow, it makes sense, doesn't it? Okay. And then when you have a mountain underwater, it could either be a volcano uh, or it can just be called a sea mount. We're going to get back to that. If it comes above water, then it's an island or a volcano, your choice. Okay, and then if you have these places where the plates come together, and I think that's really the only places they find these really deep trenches, the really deep ones, is where you have a subduction zone, where you have one plate going under another, and that's why you get such a really deep, deep trench. Uh, so this shows you the land. Once again, we got the intertidal zone right here, which is not mentioned here. You have a continental sh shelf, the continental slope. This shows you a submarine canyon, which is just something that got cut out. Um, yeah, we won't go there. There are actually landslides underwater, and they're called turbidity currents, because when there's a landslide, because look at this, you could have a landslide there, couldn't you? If some sh shook loose, it would fall because gravity would pull on it. When that happens underwater, a bunch of dirt is carried with it, and it can move very quickly. And that's, they're called turbidity currents because turbid means water with a bunch of dirt in it. So you don't have to know that. I'm just throwing it out there so you've heard it before, okay? Over the holiday, my husband had us watch an old movie called Raising the Titanic. You don't have to go watch this movie. But the point is they were, and it was fictitious, they have not raised the Titanic from the bottom. But in the movie, they did. And in the process of them doing some explosions, they had these turbidity currents. And my husband's going, look at that. And I go, oh, honey, that's a turbidity current. <laughs> it's the problem with living with a scientist, isn't it? You know. So anyway, um, notice that when you have a little mountain that it doesn't go all the way top, it's just called the sea mount. But if it goes up and then it's flat, even though the word looks like guyot, it's geo. It's a French word, geo. And I got another French word for you. Have you ever seen the word rendezvous? <clears throat> okay, because there's a car called the rendezvous, isn't there? A van or something. Well, one night my daughter, my oldest daughter, saw it. She was in about the 10th grade, and she goes, oh, look, a rendezvous. <laughs> and we were out and, as a family, and my husband and I started laughing, and my daughter was crushed, you know. And, and I said, oh, honey, don't be crushed. It's a French word. It, it's not phonetic. <laughs> it's rendezvous. And so this always makes me think of that. So, because I've called these guyotes for years. And then the book says it's a geo, and I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> so, okay, so that one's... I was just going to do a funny story about my son. Same thing, he has, he has special thing, he called it organized. I want to have some organo, original special pay. Oh, oh, and he sounded it out. That's great. So well, kind of like yes. Like, oh, it's funny how these, haven't you guys ever done that? that? You know, I never would have. Played that. Have you ever done? You have it. I remember when we drove upstate when I was a young person, and, and my parents were driving us upstate. I saw Cape Canaveral, and I go Canaveral, and they started <laughs> laughing, and I go what? And they go Canaveral. I'm, oh, and then Kissimmee, it looked like Kissimmee. <laughs> you know. At Alach Alachua? Alachua. That's what it looks like. You know, and so if you don't know how it's pronounced, a lot of these words are not phonetic. And, uh. Yes, sir? Um, when I was little, we were on a um, trip to Indiana. Yeah. And there was a lot of the Indians that were there. And I was like, four, so I called it bacon sticks. And says, no, honey, it's shaking things. That's funny. That's <laughs> funny. Uh, yeah, I, well, I know my kids used to call, my middle daughter used to call Golden Corral. When we would travel, we always go to Golden Corral because the kids could get whatever they wanted. They didn't have to wait. And so she, she was little. She called it Golden Cattle because she saw the <laughs> a picture of a cow. Let's go to Golden Cattle. We're like, okay, honey, we'll go to Golden Cattle. So <laughs> anyway, thank you for sharing. Okay. So we talked about that, and this, this is actually a picture of the continental, uh, excuse me, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Remember, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge was the ridge that runs where these plates have separated through the Atlantic Ocean. We said that that is the world's largest mountain range, longest. It literally goes from pole to pole. But if you come up here, they can actually walk in it when the tide's out in Iceland, which is wow. And wasn't it, was it a student here or in the other coast that's brother? I had showed me a picture of their brother that was scuba diving between the, the uh, mid-Atlantic Ridge pieces up in this area. And the kids, well, he's a young man now, he's got his hands on both sides of the mid-Atlantic Ridge. And I'm looking at that going, I don't think I'd feel good about that, you know? Because what if it went, eh? 
<laughs> so, <laughs> but I guess it's a spreading zone, so he felt brave. Uh, there's no way I've done that anyway. Please, Lord, don't make me do that. Anyway, um, don't ever say never, because that's exactly what God will make you do. Did everybody hear what I just said? Most important thing you're going to hear in class today. Never tell God never. That's exactly what he'll have you do. Okay? When I moved away from Gainesville, Florida, I said, I'll never come back here. I never want to come back to this place because I had such a bad experience with different things. And what did God do? About 10 years later, it was the desire of my heart to go teach creation science on the, creation science on the University of Florida campus. God moved us back into that area, not to Gainesville, but back into the area. And within a year, I spoke for FCA on campus at the University of Florida, a series on creation science. And then within a couple months of that, we moved. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm never saying never to you again. I'll say, I don't want to, please, Lord, but I don't say never anymore. So just a little warning. Anyway, okay, so today we are looking at these different zones. What are these zones divided by that we're looking at today? We're not looking at the geography today. We're looking at these different zones. What's separating these zones in the ocean that we're looking at today? Good, the, the light because of the depth. Very good. Have you guys ever been like snorkeling and seen the light beams going down in the water? Have you done that? Everybody's seen the light beams going down in the water. And do you, have you ever noticed that they do get fainter as they go through the water. So the deeper you get, the less light is actually able to penetrate the water. And because of that, from zero to 660 feet, which I don't know about you, but that is like plenty deep as far as I'm concerned, is called the sunlit zone. Because, and did they spell it with L-I-T? Yes, they did. Sunlit zone, and that's because in that upper zone, there is actually sunlight be able to penetrate the whole way. The other word that it gives you for the possible name is the euphotic zone, and I want to stall here for just a minute. This word, photo, photo, it means light. If you take a photograph, graph means picture, photo means light, so a photograph actually means a light picture. You're using light to make a picture. So that's where the name came from, photograph. <clears throat> if you've gone to a funeral and they've done a eulogy, E-U, E-U means true. God bless you. It means true. So a, a eulogy is supposed to be something true about the person that passed. Does that make sense? Okay. So euphotic, what does it mean? True light, right? That area has true light. And so what kind of things live in the, the sunlit zone? Yes, sir. Um, like coral and coral reefs. Like coral and coral reefs. Wow, you just covered a mass amount of living things, didn't yeah. you? Yeah, so that'd be fish and, 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 and turtles, which are reptiles. And um, uh, there's mammals like whales and dolphin and stuff. Um, but there's also plants. And see, that's the trick. Plants need sunlight, don't they? And do you know how we studied the hydrologic cycle and how God um, keeps using the water and he made the water on the first day 6,000 years ago and we've been using the same water ever since? Just goes round and round and, and cleaned up and used again. Well, God's done that with a lot of things and he does that with energy too. And how living systems work, and I'm gonna use the land first, okay, and then we'll go back and apply this to the ocean, all right? But how it works on land is there's plants, and the plants actually make their food from sunlight, don't they? What is that process called when a plant makes its food from sunshine? Photosynthesis, good. Once again, photo, light. Synthesis means to make. So photosynthesis is they make food with light, uh, make food with light, I said it right. Okay, so photosynthesis, plants make food with light, okay? So they're the beginning of the food chain, and this is true of the ocean too. They're the beginning of the food chain, the plants are, because they're able to actually use the sunshine for the energy to produce their own food. And then let's say on land, I'm gonna use a Florida picture here, let's say a deer eats the plant, okay? So the deer is able to use the energy from the plant to make itself, you know, the food for itself. And then the panther eats the deer, okay? So we've got our herbivore, then we've got a carnivore. So a herbivore being a vegetarian, a carnivore being a meat eater. And then when the panther dies, 
reality he'd probably get hit by a car, but let's just say he dies a natural death. Okay. When the panther dies, then fungus and bacteria will actually break it down and put it back into the soil. And then the plants will use those parts as fertilizer and the whole thing cycles again. Okay, do you see the circle? So God's got that circle of energy going on. And it's not just in the land, on the land, it's in the ocean too. So the sunlit zone is where the plants are. Now the plants in the ocean, most of us would think of the seagrass like turtle grass or maybe seaweed because we see so much of it on the beach, don't we? Okay, seaweed is actually one of those plants. Those are actually algae. They're not a, a real plant. They're, they're classified. We classify them with algae. Most algaes though are single cellular. And I bet you don't know this, but most of the oxygen produced in our atmosphere that we breathe comes from the single cellular algae in the ocean, like almost 80% comes from the single celled algae in the ocean, not the Amazon rainforest like everybody wants you to believe. So if we mess up the oceans, we're gonna be out of oxygen. I, I want you to put that together, okay? It's the little bitty algae. Now those little bitty algae are little tiny plants that are using that sunlight in that euphotic zone, in the sunlit zone, to get the energy. So who do you think's eating them? Little tiny animals, right? And then, here, let's see if we can find little tiny animals. Nope, we're going right into bioluminescence, so we'll just stay there for a minute. Then little tiny animals will eat them. And then little tiny fish will eat the little tiny animals. Then bigger fish will eat those fish, right? And then you get, a, of course, unless you're a whale, and then you're going to eat a whole bunch of krill, which is a shrimp. But you know what I'm saying. And usually it goes up and up. And then eventually when the upper thing dies, let's say it's a shark. We'll go all the way to the top of the shark. Uh, when the carnivore dies, once again, he breaks down. And the bacteria and the fungi and some scavengers will eat him and put him into the bottom. And then the whole process will start over again. Okay, although the plants in the ocean, they don't need the fertilizer, do they? <laughs> They're just doing it up there on their own. Okay, so that, there's a lot going on in this zone, isn't there? Because that's basically where most of the life is and because the sunshine really predominantly, not totally, but predominantly provides the energy necessary for life, both in the ocean and on land. The exception to that rule you read about this week was the... Uh, deep sea smokers. Remember you read about those vents, the deep sea smokers? Um, that there actually are bacteria down there that can use the energy from the heat coming out of the interior of the earth to do the same kind of, it's a photosynthesis without the light. They actually use the particles of light that are coming from the heat. It's really, really quite interesting. They've only recently found it. Anyway, the zone below there. So we go from 660 Two, three, three, zero, zero, there you go. I don't know about you, this is way too deep for me. Just, okay. This part is called the twilight zone. And its other name is the diphotic zone, which I'm not exactly sure why they call it that, because di to me means two. Oh, it's dis, uh, excuse me, if I spelled it right, it might help. Uh, dysphotic zone. That probably means there's just not a lot of light there, right? Okay, and they say there's some light there, but not a whole lot. And this is where you find a lot of the bioluminescent creatures, um, like some shrimp that can bioluminesce, hatchet fish, and then there's a lot of these bigger fish that can still swim through there. Um, and then, and we're gonna come back to the bioluminescence in just a second. And then below that, we have, so we've got from 3.30, to, I think it was 13,200 feet, which is insanely deep. And that was the midnight zone. And it's the aphotic zone. Now, first off, I skipped something here and shame on me. Somebody tell me, what's twilight? Um, That's a good description. No, no, that's good. Partial light, somewhere between dark and light. So before the sun comes up in the morning, but it's light, that's twilight. When the sun's gone down, but it's still light, that's twilight. Okay, I had a dog named Twilight, but we won't go there. And so twilight is that period right between light and darkness. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you know what this actually means. 
and everybody knows what midnight means. It's dark. In most places, it's dark. If you put an A in front of a word, and in science, you're going to see this a lot, it means the opposite of, okay? And so here, it's aphotic, which means it's the opposite of light. It's literally the opposite. Here, you're kind of dis. It's like, eh. here, it's like, ah, ah, A, okay? So it's really, really dark there. Not a lot of light there. Notice it's got tripod fish because they live on the bottom. I'm going to show you one of those. Angler fish, uh, giant squid. Um, the uh, sperm whale that likes to eat the giant squid will go down there. Now, this one, that is, see, I knew I had it somewhere. There's your phytoplankton. That's your algae. Okay, that's what they call algae in the ocean. Is phyto, P-H-Y-T, means plant. And plankton is anything that floats around in the ocean. So phytoplankton are little tiny plants. Zo, just like the zoo has animals, zooplankton is little tiny animals. So these little tiny animals eat the little tiny plants and then little tiny fish eat those and on and on and up it goes. Okay, but you notice here that the deeper you get, the less actual varieties you have. And actually like this gulper eel, it says that they actually wait for things to die and then something's going to hit it and try to eat it on the way down. But whatever little dregs are left, this poor little guy's cruising around the bottom trying to eat whatever's left. And they said that the gulper eel is actually able to unhinge his jaws so that it can eat things that are bigger than it is. And several of these things could eat things that were bigger than they were. Now, let's go back to bioluminescence because I think it's cool. Okay. Bioluminescence, your book actually said that it had to do with bacteria in the creature that were able to actually make light. And I've read some other possibilities of what causes bioluminescence, and I'm going to be really honest with you because I actually watch a really cool thing on YouTube about it, but it was a lecture from a, a, a PhD in California, so I don't think you want to watch it because you might not enjoy it as much as I did. But what I got out of it that I want to share with you is they really don't know why these critters bioluminesce. They're still trying to figure it out, and they're really quite interesting and quite comical if you watch what they do, because they think they're actually communicating with each other in some instances. Sometimes they bioluminesce to defend themselves. They'll squirt out light, and then like the shrimp do, something's trying to eat a shrimp, he'll squirt out light, and then he'll disappear. So while the thing's blinded by the light, he's cruising in the other direction. They think sometimes they're actually talking to each other. And the reason is they actually put in the Mahamas at 2,000 feet down. They put a little camera thing with a strobe, a strobe light, a, a flashing light. And they turned it on on a certain frequency and watched what happened. And all of a sudden, when the thing started flashing, something appeared in the darkness over here and started flashing back to it. Something over here appeared in the darkness and started flashing back to it. And they said, we're obviously talking to these things, but we don't know what we're saying. <laughs> and then they did it at 3,000 feet, so it was deeper. And they did one. And they, there were two squid, and they were so funny. The first squid comes down when this starts flashing, and the squid attacks the thing. Huh, you know? And these were big squid. They were like three feet long. Um, the second one was funnier, though, because it came down very tentatively and looked at it, and it came back up. Then it went down like three different times. It came down, it came up, and then it was so cute. The lady goes, well, she, he didn't figure that out, so he came in at a different angle. Next time it comes in this way, <laughs> and then goes back up. So maybe it's a form of communication, and they're, it, they were speaking gibberish because and that really confused the squid. I don't know, but some of these critters, okay, I just want to, does anybody want to guess what is this critter? That's actually a squid. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. Can you see underneath? You're actually looking probably from underneath these guys. This is the underneath portion of one of these fish. If you're looking up at him, you're seeing this. That is probably a jellyfish. Now, um, these are just some different types of bioluminescence that they see. And they actually, that one I told you, that first one at 2,000 feet, it actually looked something like this, only it was like pearls. It just all of a sudden showed up in light. And, but, but it was like somebody was playing the pearls. They actually, on her, her thing, she showed a little creature that's bioluminescent that's a stalk, um, and it, it attaches to the bottom, but it looks something like this, okay? It attaches to the bottom, and it was bioluminescent. And she showed, they took it and they squeezed it here, and the light traveled up, all the way up the critter. So then they squeezed it here, the light traveled all the way down this way. So then they squeezed it in the middle, the light traveled out in both directions. <laughs> so like I said, they're still learning about bioluminescence, and if that's something of interest to you, that's an area 
that scientists are still trying to learn in. Now, personally, I wouldn't get into a sub and go down how far they have to go. And she ends the lecture with, everybody should get in a submersible and go down if you have the opportunity. And I'm looking at that going, I don't think so. I'm going to let you do that and come back and tell me what you find. You know, I just, I'm a little claustrophobic. It freaks me out. But some of you may be really brave and want to do stuff like that. And this is, uh, Nina's going, I don't think so either. I'm with you. Anyway, um, now, I wanted to, these jellyfish actually have bioluminescence, and that is a comb jelly. You've probably seen these in the water before, but you probably never saw the rainbow colors going down it. And if you get them in the dark, they actually have rainbow colors. I used to think bioluminescence was only in the deep oceans. It's not. It's on the coral reefs, too. The trick is most of us don't get out there at night because that's when the sharks feed. So... But the point is that I've actually seen YouTube videos where they're on just coral reefs and as you touch things, they bioluminesce, which is freaky when you think about it, okay? So, and I had a student on the other coast that told me that if you catch a comb jelly and you video it with your phone in the dark, he said, you'll see on the video, if you slow it down, you'll see the colors rippling through it which I, th I told them, okay, you got to catch me one now and we're going to do this. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool. There's your normal squid, and that's the underside of the squid. Now, there's something here I want to just throw out because this is what I used to think and maybe possibly true, I don't know. There's something in the oceans called countershading. Um, you know how a, a killer whale is black over the top and white underneath, right? That's called countershading. Um, you see that in penguins. They have a white belly and a black back, so if they're swimming, white underneath, black over the top. Um, sailfish, marlin, they are so silvery white under the bottom, dark over the top, correct? You've seen this pattern over and over. That's called countershading. And the reason it's called countershading, it's a camouflage. The reason it's called countershading is if you're underneath them looking up, the white looks like the sky, so you don't see them. If you're above him in the water looking down, the dark looks like the ocean underneath where it's dark. So these animals are actually camouflaged with this countershading. Well, some people believe that the, the lights that are on the bottom of these guys might be countershading. So where something underneath it is looking up and maybe thinks he's seeing stars, you know, when they see this. I don't know because I'm figuring anything that lives in these areas, they don't see stars anyway. So I don't know. But um, that's how the fish lights up. That's a lantern fish. Now, I got to ask you a question. When you hear about these things, don't you always think they're huge, right? That's a viper fish. It's like a sardine. I looked at that and I went, wait a minute. I always see pictures of that and think it's this big, nasty, argh, you know, fish, right? He's a little bitty guy. Unnecessarily high definition pictures of them. I don't know. I guess because they're trying hard. I don't that's know. Slow. Yeah, it's that's what I'm saying. They're really not that big. Uh, that is a thread tail fish, and that's showing you his tubular eyes. They uh, certain ones of these are designed for these areas with very little light. This guy would li live in the twilight zone. <laughs> That sounds so funny. He lives in the twilight zone. It sounds like the old series, you know. Do, 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 do. <laughs> he looks like something from the twilight zone, doesn't he? Anyway, the t yeah, right? The tubular eyes actually help him to gather more light. So what little light is there, he's able to pick up. Had a student in your class on the other coast tell me yesterday that uh, owl's eyes are actually tubular. And I have never heard that before. And then he says, you know, do you know why they have to move their head? And I go, because they can't move their eyes. And I don't know, if you, if you have a bird, you've probably noticed they'll cock their head when they're looking at you. It's because they can't move their eyes. So they have to move their head to be able to focus. <laughs> but these tubular eyes, and then don't freak out. Okay, that's a hatchet fish. Look at his eyes. I know. It looks like a horror movie, doesn't it? But... That's the hatchet fish from the side, and if you look at him underneath, this is what he looks like. He bioluminesces underneath, but his eyes are designed in a very strange way so that he can pick up more light. Because once again, I'll say he lives in the dysphotic zone. How's that? He lives in the twilight zone. Uh, he looks like something from the twilight zone, doesn't he? Yeah. Anyway, and then we already saw the comb jelly. Um, okay. That shows you a viper fish trying to eat a, uh, 
It, no, that's actually a shrimp. It may look like a seahorse from back there, but it's a shrimp. Oh, and a, a lot of the critters, oh, the blue thing is actually the bioluminescence. And what the shrimp does is when something goes to bite him, he squirts that bioluminescence out, and the fish tends to want to bite that while the, the shrimp disappears. And so the other thing that I'm just going to mention, because it's uh, only mentioned slightly in your book, a lot of these deep sea animals, either they don't have any color at all or they're red. And it's interesting how many of them are bright red. Um, and so that shrimp, notice he's bright red. Uh, once again, showing you the bioluminescence. This is an ostracod. It looks like a little tiny um, sand, sand, sea flea, right? Doesn't he? Looks like kind of a little tiny ocean type flea. These are very, very, very small. They bioluminesce, and that shows you what they can look like on the beach. And even here, if you go out at certain times a year and you shake the water or you drop something in the water so the water is disturbed, it will bioluminesce because it's the algae and the bioluminescent bacteria in the water that will actually bioluminesce. So, like I said, I just think bioluminescence is cool. Anyway, all right, oh, there's your gulper eel, and that's the one that can unhinge his jaw so that he can pick up whatever on the bottom because he, let's be honest, if you lived way down in one of these zones, you wouldn't get much food, would you? So it's only whatever everybody else couldn't get a bite out of that manages to get down to the bottom. And because think about what fish are like. Have you ever had a fish die in your fish tank? The other fish goes start eating it, right? It doesn't usually, very little goes to the bottom. So this guy's got to depend on whatever's left that hasn't gotten eaten up top that finally comes down so he can eat. Uh, other things that are on these bottoms, and there aren't a lot of fish, once again, these are sea cucumbers. <laughs> This actually says it's a sea cucumber stampede. I thought that was funny. Um, we do have sea cucumbers on coral reefs and stuff, but there are deep sea, cu sea cucumbers that are down there in these really huge depths that we see. And your book did talk about that there is the abyss, which is the fourth zone. I didn't put it. It's deeper than this. So here, I'll just add here abyss, OK? And. Uh, in that area, there's not even a lot of stuff that lives in these abysses. Somebody tell me why. What's up? When you get below 13,000 feet, what, why is it hard for things to live in those areas? The water pressure. Thank you. The water pressure is immense. Didn't we read it was like a thousand times what it is up here? Let's see. It's, yep, it's a thousand times. It's 14,000 pounds per square inch. That's a thousand times more pressure than it is here at sea level. That's intense. A matter of fact, when they pull some of these fishes up, I didn't bring you a picture of the blobfish, but some of these fish, when they bring them up to look at them, they don't look right. They look like jello, and it's because they're designed to live at that depth. So when you bring them up where there's no pressure, their bodies just kind of go, and it's sad. Yes? There, there was a thing on Shark Week that talked about that. There was guys out in the boat, like in China, and they were trying to see if they could get up what they found was so interesting is they would bring them up and they would study them and tag them. And these sharks could dive down so fast and so deep and that they were, that it's just uncanny that they don't have any issue diving down so deep. Like and coming up. Right. It's amazing up. that yeah, they can they adjust. Up. And then they let them go after they tag them and they would go down like, so I, I was checking on my phone to see if it's safe, but I swore he said like, you know, a thousand meters and then it was going down. Which is three plus three thousand feet. And down and down. Yeah. Because they brought him up from the midnight zone. So he was going wow, and he was going back, going down. back down. Isn't that amazing? And some of that, now see, that's a shark. And shark uh, have a different kind of skeletal structure than fish do. Um, but th it's interesting that some of these, like the sperm whale, could go down and then come back up. And he's a mammal. Yeah. So it's amazing that some of these things can withstand that kind of pressure. Because if you took a sub down there, it would just implode. It would crush it. Th that's why we have trouble, yeah. I know, Eli's back there going, <laughs> and I'm with you. But the, you wouldn't want to be in there when it did that, would you? No, it's like being in a tin can when it's getting crushed. Anyway, these are just showing you some of these red prawns. It talked about it on page 131 where there's some red shrimp that live on the bottom. I'm not exactly sure the difference between a prawn and a shrimp. I, I, I'm just, are they just two different names? I always think of a prawn as something a little bigger than a shrimp, but it, it's just a shrimp, right? So that's an anglerfish. You've seen these before. I don't know about you, but like Daniel and I were saying, from the pictures that we see, I always figured that the, uh, this anglerfish was a pretty good sized fish, at least like this big. But the pictures I'm seeing, they're about this big. They're, they're a lot smaller. 
And that, <laughs> that is an anglerfish walking along the bottom looking for something to eat. Now, um, I want to mention this because an evolutionist would look at this and say, well, obviously he's evolving because it's a fish learning how to walk. But excuse me, they still exist just the same way as they've existed all along. He's designed to walk along the bottom because he lives on the bottom and that's where he's got to eat. And so some of these fish can actually walk along the bottom on their fins. I thought that was pretty cool, don't you? Yeah. And that's a tripod fish. Remember it? Yeah, no, they're not. They're pretty small. Now, there are some giants that they find, but those are around the smokers, Daniel. They're not just in the depths. They're in the depths, but near the smokers. They do find some giant fish and giant weird things there. But just the general bottom, they don't. And I think it's because, well, I know what I think. Why might you think that the critters are smaller than we thought? Yes? Because of how compact, like how when you go lower and sub, it smushes in. Okay, so maybe they're smaller to withstand the pressure. That's a good guess. What else did we mention there was a lack of down there? Fish. Food. Exactly. Fish eat other fish, don't they? There's a lack of food. And so if there's a lack of food, that would be self-limiting on the size, wouldn't it? And I hadn't thought about it because like, I, like Daniel was saying, whenever I saw pictures of viper fish and hatchet fish and, and uh, angler fish, they always make them look so big and scary, don't they? Um, but they're just not that big. They're different and they're a little weird, but they're just not that big. Now, on the ocean floors, we're told that there are some brittle stars and some sea cucumbers and things like that found uh, even at these really, really, really deep areas, but not a lot of fish anymore. So you see the fish are mostly in the uh, sunlit zone. You have some fish that can survive in the twilight and midnight, but the abyssal area, you really don't have fish. Yes, Eli. Can you just like uh, remind me what uh, the angler fish you like remember from the most? Yeah. Yeah, the part that you... Oh yeah, and the light went on. Yeah. You're right, that was. That, I forgot about that. I haven't seen Nemo in a while. Okay, that is a sea spider. And one of my kids on the other coast, they're, they're from the midnight zone. One of my kids on the other coast remembers having seen one of these at a, a aquarium, you know, one of those places you go see critters. And she said it was huge. It was like the size of her torso. It was huge. Yeah, so these things are kind of creepy, scary, you know, in that, that creepy, scary classification. Okay, so those are the sea spiders. It's it's a crab, but they. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. They call it's a giant sea spider, and I think they call it a um, spider because it looks like a spider. But no, that's a crab. Okay, let's go on and do the last one. We've got our vents and smokers, and it calls them here underwater volcanoes. Um, these are actually deep in the ocean, and. It's a vent from the interior of the earth. And so you have this very hot water, although there are cold smokers too, but you have in these very hot water coming out. In the cases of the cold smokers, it's cold water coming out, but either way, it's coming out full of minerals. And those minerals fall out and actually build what are called chimneys. It's logical to call them chimneys, right? Because there's smoke coming out of them. I like that. Anyway, and so if they're a black smoker, like this one is, they have a lot of black minerals in them, and so they'll build the chimney and it'll look blacker. Um, we see these things, and this is why we think they've got to do with the interior of the earth. We notice the smokers are near where you have the plates once again. So it looks like there's openings um, that allow them to occur. That's one that's a black smoker, but I don't know about you, that's got some orange color in it, doesn't it? So there's some other colors going on in there. But living things will actually live around these smokers because there's energy and the heat coming out of there. Um, who can tell me what are these critters called? Do you remember? That's, those are living things. There they are. The first word is giant. It's a, somebody said it. It's a tube worm. It's a giant tube worm. And these things can get six feet long around some of these smokers. That's as long as like, well, it's almost as long as your table. That's a big worm, isn't it? Yeah. The smokers are where you find giant things in the deep sea, not counting the giant squid or the sperm whale. Okay. <laughs> you know, we're talking other stuff. Uh, but around these smokers, you do see some giants. And we're gonna, I'm going to show you a few of them. Yes. 
No, all the time. It's kind of like, that's why your book called it an underwater volcano, because it's just kind of like bubbling all the time. That's a good question. At least, Nina, I should say this, as far as we know now, let's be honest, these things are at the bottom of the ocean, and I don't know, uh, they only found them in 1977 from what the book said, so I don't know if people have really watched them constantly, but apparently they're coming from the bottom of the ocean, so it's pretty regular that it's coming out. It's a good question. Okay. So we have giant tube worms. Um, another thing that lives there, you tell me, what kind of critter is that? Good, it's a sea anemone. We just talked about it, a sea anemone. And what kind of critter is that? Crab. Crab. And what kind of critter is this and this and this and this? Yeah, it's some kind of a mussel, isn't it? Right. Uh, let's see. Oh, there's another critter. Okay, so we're seeing there, oh, oh, and these, these little bitty guys, they look like little bitty, maybe little clams? What do you think? Yeah, yeah maybe? Yeah. Okay, or maybe they're little barnacles. You know, I've seen barnacles that are shaped like that before, so maybe they're barnacles. The point is, there are living things down at these smokers, and look, they even found a fish. What do you notice that's weird about that fish? Oh, it looks like Yeah, because he has no color, does he? But does he need color down there? No, because there's no light. So that's why it's kind of strange that some of them are red and then others are colorless. Um, but it's pretty weird. That is a giant isopod. This guy is about four feet long. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but that looks to me like something that would come out of the twilight zone. You know, do, 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 do. I mean, if this dude came after me, I'd be gone. Okay? Especially he's that big. You know, anyway, um, okay, I told you that there are bacteria, I don't want to get into all this with you, but there are actually bacteria that are able, this is showing you that plants use sunlight to make food, but these smokers provide hydrogen sulfide and there are bacteria that can use that to actually start the photosynthetic process, but with them it's a chemosynthetic process, they're using chemicals instead. And that's actually the bacteria they found that can do that down there. And then that starts the food chain around these smokers, which is pretty cool when you think about it. Oh, and these guys are supposed to be able to pick up like one photon of light from the heat that's coming out of these things, which is incredibly small. And they're able to utilize that. Light is made up of particles that move in waves, as far as we know now, and a one particle of light is called a photon. And these guys can pick up one photon? You know, it's like, oh. It's insane. So, and they only recently found them. And so that's why they attribute all this life. Now that's a cold seep. That's a cold seep in the Gulf of Mexico. And a cold seep is actually where the minerals are seeping out from underneath the bottom, but it's not hot. Notice there's a lot of life in those areas. And that's a white smoker. Remember I told you some of them are black, but some of them are white. So that's a picture of a white smoker. Um, here you see where in the Gulf of Mexico that we actually see these things. Remember I told you the uh, continental shelf is really large on the west coast. Do you see that? It's, it's huge on my side. I live, uh, I live about right here. Okay, see it's kind of green. <laughs> That's Big Cypress Swamp. <laughs> anyway, so um, this is where we find a lot of these uh, seeps. And there's one other type of a deep ocean ecosystem, which is an ecosystem is just a place where things live, okay? And it's called a uh, whale fall. When a whale finally dies, and he goes to the bottom after whoever's going to take a bite out of him has taken a bite, whatever's left goes to the bottom, then a whole community starts to live in that area. Things will just all of a sudden show up from, from the midnight zone and start to live in that area because that's a food source. When the food source is gone, then they will all move and disappear to someplace else. They've only recently found this. That's a picture of real, a real whale fall. So you can see the bones of the whale that are left, but you can see there's critters that live there. And so that's the one other kind of deep sea um, community. Have a good week. <laughs>